Aquila, huh? The eagle, the protector, the great hunter of the stars. Ora, grab Wingnut. I'll get Yaksha. I yelled as we fell towards the ground after being blasted off the palisade by another one of Wolfsbane's unicorns. What about Vervain? Wingnut yelled as Zora took him off and opened her wings. I'll be fine, kid. Vervain yelled as she flipped around in midair, making sure her hooves were pointed down. Using my magic, I took hold of Yaksha and pulled her close to me. I looked down as I did and saw the ground was a lot closer than I thought. Windthrasher and Stardust both opened their wings to slow their fall. I would have had them grab Yaksha and me, but there wasn't any time. Once she was close, I concentrated and at the last possible second teleported us. They both reappeared a second later, rolling across the main street of Cartwheel's ruins. I cursed, then got up and looked back up at the palisade that loomed over the dead town. As I did, the thrusters from the zeppelin came to life. Before I knew it, the palisade started flying away, heading west back towards Los Alicorn. The rest of my friends landed a moment later. Mervain first. She slammed into the ground not far away from Yaksha and me. An explosion of dust and small rocks blowing away from her power-armored body. Aura with Wingnut, Windthrasher, the Stranger, and Stardust not far behind. Once they were all safely on the ground, Aura looked up at the treating palisade, saying, If we hurry, we can still get to Wolfsbane before they get away. No. You'll get what's coming to him in time. The stranger said, wincing a little as he tried to take a step. It looked like he hurt one of his forehooves during the fight. Vervain ignored us. She turned towards the Extraction Express, screaming, Dad! The power armor she stole opened, and she ran over to a small lump laying at the bottom of the rubble. That was all that was left of the Equestrian Express. The rest of us followed as Vervain stopped next to the body of her father. The old buck was broken. His limbs were laying in different directions. His back was kinked oddly. Blood covered his muzzle and his eyes were locked open, looking up towards the rainy night sky. I moved closer and knelt towards the old buck, tears starting to fall. Ravane pressed her face into box tape's chest, sobbing uncontrollably. Why'd you come up here, Dad? You knew nothing like this would happen. I put a hoof on Ravane's back and rubbed it slowly, letting my tears fall freely. I looked back at box tape's face and was amazed at what I saw. He was still smiling. His lips were pulled up in a small smile as his lifeless body looked up at the heavens. It was almost like he knew what was going to happen, and he was happy he was able to sacrifice himself to save a mare he cared about. He had only saved me when he pushed me out of the way of Wolfsbane's last attack. He also made sure his daughter was safe. His actions made it possible for us to escape the palisade in one piece. We died a hero. He died doing what a father will always do for his children, and he did it with a smile. I reached out with my free hoof and slowly closed his eyes, saying, May the goddesses watch over you for now, box tape. I hope you find peace at last in the next life. Tell Silver I said hi. That I miss her. Mervain sniffed and pulled her face away from her father, saying in a quiet voice, Dad never believed in the goddess's shadow. That took me by surprise. Then, what did he believe? I thought that every pony believed in the goddesses. There was a sound of several bodies gently landing in the wet street behind us, followed by Gigi's voice. No, not every pony does shadow. Box Tape was a good friend with the Red Talons. He didn't think that there's an afterlife like most ponies. He saw death in much the same way as we griffins do. I looked over and saw Gigi, Apollo, and several other griffins from the Red Talons, all sat looking around at was left of Cartwheel. Apollo slowly walked over to us and knelt on the other side of the old buck. As he spoke, his voice was shaking, almost like he was close to crying himself. We tried to get here as fast as we could, but we were held up by some of those unchained talons. If we had been a few minutes earlier, we could have saved him. Stardust sighed as he said, I don't think you could have. The old buck knew he wouldn't win against Wolfsbane. He could have if he didn't have to get out of his armor, and if he wasn't protecting us. 
Mervain said. I think he knew he was dying already. His body couldn't take the strain that suit put on him anymore. He also couldn't go through another detox from the chems. This was his way of going out in style. I just wish it hadn't been my brother who had did it. Her mind was still stuck on what Gigi said. If Griffins don't believe in an afterlife, then what do you all think happens when you die? An old griffin walked closer. He had a kind-looking face. His feathers were a mix of dull blue and gray. His fur was brown and his beak was gray as well. When he spoke, his voice was also kind and gentle. I wouldn't say that we don't believe in an afterlife, young mare. We believe that if a griffin were to reach that level of peace, they must do something great with their life. Something noble and heroic. If a griffin didn't, their soul will come back and start a new life so that they can try and prove themselves again. When the old griffin walked closer to Box Tape's body, Aura took a step back, bowing a little. Tonto, it's wonderful to see you. His bright eyes fell onto Aura's and he smiled. All right, young one. I'm glad to see you're still doing well. Yigi came over to me saying, Shadow, what happened here? I tried to answer, but I felt like a rock was stuck in my throat. It was the stranger who answered. It was Wolfsbane. He came for Shadow and destroyed the town and killed his father. Apollo looked up with anger written on his face. We saw the airship, but we can't believe Wolfsbane would let this happen. I know he hates this town and his father, but he wouldn't do something this crazy. He did, the stranger said. He was also working with Gina, and they killed a lot of the town ponies, then took Shadow and her friend hostage. Gigi looked over the stranger. Gina was here too. Now you sure? I am, the stranger said. She flew off after Aura wounded her. Which way did she go? Gigi asked. Aura spoke up. She headed in the direction of Halo 1. I stabbed her with my spear. She took a healing potion when she flew off. But it won't do her much apart from stopping the bleeding. Gigi then turned towards a few griffins. Go after her. If she's wounded that bad, you should be able to subdue her. I want her taken to Crimson Canyon alive. The two griffins saluted. Yes, ma'am. I'll go too, Apollo said. No, I need you here, Gigi said as the other griffins flew off. Box tape was our friend. We should stay long enough to see him off properly. You owe him that much, Apollo. Yes, dear, he said. I sat down, ignoring the rain flowing over my face as I stared at the body of box tape still not able to comprehend the fact that he was dead. A few moments later, Aura's talons wrapped around me and pulled me close. I'm gonna miss him too, Shadow. I sniffed. It's just hard to believe he's gone. He was so full of life. Ravain and my friends came to sit next to me as well. Ravain saying, He was. And that's what made him such a great stallion. Even though it's hard to accept that he died. At least he went down the way he did. I couldn't imagine my father dying in his bed. Too old to even feed himself like a lot of ponies in the wasteland do. Gigi came over. Vervain, it's good to see you again. Same for you, Gillian. Vervain did her best smile. Gigi put a talon on Vervain's shoulder and asked, If you want, Tanto can perform a service for your father. If I remember right, he always wanted a griffin funeral when he passed. Ravane started to cry again. It took her a moment to regain her composure. But once she did, she nodded. It would be an honor. Okay. Give us an hour or so and we can prepare it. The rest of my griffins will help find the rest of the ponies who died here today so that they can be buried. I looked over at Gigi. I hate to ask, but why would you do that for Cartwheel? When Gigi looked over at me, I saw sadness in her eyes. Because Cartwheel has always been friends with the Crimson Canyon. All of my talons knew every pony that lived here. They were our friends, and we lost them today. 
is the least we can do for them. As we talked, I saw two griffins carefully lift Boxtape's body, carrying him towards the middle of town. I felt a fresh wave of grief come over me as I watched his body being carried away. Then Nora said, We should go and rest while we wait. You took a nasty beating back there, Shadow. I want to make sure you're okay. I looked around the destroyed town, asking, Where in Luna's name are we going to rest? Cartwheel's gone? She pointed down the road a little, and I saw one building that hadn't been completely destroyed. Silver's home was still standing strong, the last building still intact in Cartwheel. Silver's place will do fine. She has three bedrooms in it. We'll rest up there for now. Mom will let us know when everything's ready. I wanted to protest, but still didn't want to go to Silver's home. But I knew she was right. So I let Aura help me up and lead me away. My friends followed close behind, same for the stranger. We walked in, and I saw that the shop in the front was still the same as when I'd first arrived here many weeks ago. Armor was set up on one side of the shop, from the more expensive uh, combat armor to the inexpensive leather armor. On the other side of the shop, I could see a few dresses on display and some normal everyday clothes as well. And this place seems so... Lifeless, with her gone, I said as we walked past the small shop and into the living quarters. It is still a nice place, Yaksha said as she moved to go sit on the couch. Shadow, if you don't mind, I'm going to try and take a nap. My head hurts, Windthrasher said. That's fine, Windthrasher. I'm going to do the same. I'll room with Windthrasher for now, Vivane said sniffling a little as she tried to hold back her emotions. I'm gonna try to get a nap in, too, Wingnut said. That's a good idea, kid. I think I'm gonna do the same, Stardust said as they all left to find a room to stay in. When they were gone, the stranger sighed, saying, I should get back to Stratus. I'll need to make a report about what happened. To my surprise, Yaksha perked up, saying, Why leave so soon? It looks like you hurt your hoof in that fight. Maybe you should stay and rest up a little as well. The stranger looked over at Yaksha and sighed. It's not like I'm going to be missed any time soon, I guess. I'd feel better with you around, I told him. Yeah, stranger, you're always running off. You should stay a little while. If you want, I can look at that hoof of yours, Aura said. I guess it can't hurt. But don't worry about my hoof. I'll be okay. He said, limping over to sit next to Yaksha. Yaksha smiled at the stranger, saying, So tell me, where are you from? Stratus. Why? Is that where you are from, or where do you live now? The stranger closed his eyes. I'm from Nimbus originally. Forgive me, but why do you want to know? No reason, really. I just like to know things, is all, Yaksha said. Your eyes remind me of another stallion that I used to know from Nimbus. Though I know that you cannot be him, because a lot of reports I have acquired say that he is dead. The stranger stiffened. So what? A lot of ponies have green eyes. Not like yours. Yours shimmer like an emerald under a jewel's light. They kind of remind me of the many gems I saw in Gravel City. Yaksha said with a smile. I want to know, but I get a feeling you would not say much more than you already have. Yeah, you got that right. I've been trying to get him to tell me for weeks now who he is, I said. Aura perked up at Yaksha. Wait a minute. What do you mean in Gravel City? That place is nothing but ruins. It's been in nothing but ruins since the Mega Spells. There's no way you could have been there. Yaksha looked back to Aura, still smiling. Yes, Aura. I was there, but when I first arrived, the place was in ruins. However, there is a cave around that area that survivors from the Mega Spells took shelter in and lived out their lives. It was very secluded. You are pulling my feathers, Yaksha. I've been there many times and never once saw this cave. 
Nora said. Yaksha's smile faded a little. Well, of course. You did not see the caves. It was caved in by hellhounds. The ponies that lived there dug deeper, always finding more and more gems they could use to trade with selected settlements. One day they dug too deep, and came upon an open cavern with more gems, but also the nest of the hellhounds. They were not happy, as you can imagine, which resulted in a battle, slaughtering just about every pony there. I should know. I was part of the battle, as was a friend I mentioned. A lot of ponies, including its leader, Silverlight, died. Surviving multiple hellhounds? You're very lucky, Yaksha. Sounds like it was a rough time for you and your friend, I said. Yaksha sighed. It was, Shadowstar. If it were not for my friend during that battle, I would have died. Most of the hellhounds were taken care of, but I remember this one very large hellhound. Impossible to kill, just tearing through ponies like paper. After seeing most of its pack die in front of it, it started breaking to the weak points of the gravel rock city, causing it to cave in. Just then, a strange beeping noise came from where Yaksha was sitting. She reached into her saddlebags and pulled out some kind of strange device, looking at it and saying, If you would excuse me, it looks like a contact out there is finally sending me a transmission. I will be right back. As she got up to head back outside, I asked, What is that thing? A portable broadcaster. I told Sheena to tell my contact that I was heading out here when he came to the kingdom. It looks like he found me rather quickly. I just need to let him know to stay away from Cartwheel. I can meet with him tomorrow after everything has settled down. She said before heading back outside. She is a strange zebra, the stranger said. She is, but she's also a nice mare, I said. She did save me from wrath while I was in the absent ruins. I heard about that. I'm sorry I couldn't get to you in time myself. He said before closing his eyes. You should go rest up too, Shadow. Good idea, Aura said. Come on, Shadow. I followed Aura as she led me down a hall and into the same room Silver let me use when I stayed with her the first night I was there. I saw the old rifle I stole from that raider blade was still sitting in one corner. The bed was still ruffled from when Silver woke me up so uh, she could hide me over at Box Tape's place. It was like I never left. A fresh wave of emotion threatened to overwhelm me again. Then Aura picked me up and hugged me tight. There's no need to be sad, Shadow. Remember, I'm here for you. I hugged her back as I moved to lay across the bed. I rested my head on her chest as she pulled the blankets over to cover us both. Even though I had a lot of stuff running through my head, my emotions were all over the place. I felt like crying all night. I soon found myself drifting off to sleep, as Zora held me closer to her, humming a song that I hadn't heard since I was a foal. I was in my room, laying in the small bed Dad had made for me. Mom was tucking me in for the night and using her magic to make sure I'd be able to sleep through the night without being in any pain. I looked up at her, asking, Mommy, I'm scared. I heard my dad's voice from the doorway. There's no need to be scared, Star. Your father's right, sweetie. Sleeping in this bed is no different than your crib. It just has no walls. I don't care how small you are for your age. You're three now, and you need to sleep in a bed that's real. Mom said. I want Avon, I said. Mom looked over at Dad, who was just a dark outline in the doorway. Dear, where's a stuffed animal? I thought you were washing it. Dad said. I did. Then I asked you to make sure it dried. You know she can't sleep without it. I teared up a little. I want Avon! Mom looked over at me. Shh, Star, you know you can't get worked up. But I want it! I said louder. Dad came over and patted my head, then kissed my horn, his outline still shadowy. I can't remember what he looked like. Star. Please don't yell at your mother. Don't worry, I'll find Avon. But right now, you need to try and sleep. I pouted. 
But I can't sleep without him. Ah, but you can. If you just close your eyes, you'll be fine. If I find him, I'll bring him to you later, okay? Dad said. I... guess? There's my brave little filly, he said. Now try and get some sleep. I'll come check on you later. Mom kissed me too, saying, I'll see you in the morning, Star. I love you. I yawned. I love you too. The two of them walked out of the room, leaving the door cracked open a little so some light came into the room from the hall. I did my best to close my eyes and sleep. But every time I did, I kept hearing some strange noises. I wanted to yell for Mom or Dad, but they would just tell me that the wind outside or something like that was the issue. Then the door to my room creaked open a little and my eyes snapped open. When I looked at the door, no pony was there. I thought I saw what looked like a shadow flip by the door for a second, though. I lifted my head and said quietly, Is some pony there? In the darkest part of the room, I saw the darkness move. Then a moment later, a tall golden stallion was standing there, smiling at me. Don't worry, Star, it's only me. Uncle Ori, I said. He walked over me and said quietly, Not so loud. Your father would be very angry if he knew I was here. I quieted down, saying, Sorry, Uncle Ori. He hugged me. It's all right, sweetie. Tell me, what are you still doing up? I frowned. Daddy lost Avon, and I can't sleep without him. Ori Callis put on a serious face. But it was a silly serious face. Oh no, that's never good. What are you going to do, Star? I don't know. Daddy said I should be brave, but it's hard to do without Avon. He's my protector. Uncle Ori Callis was about to say something when the door to my room opened a little and Dad said, Star, you need to go to bed. My uncle's body turned into shadow again, and he vanished for a moment. That wasn't the first time he'd come to see me right after bedtime. He was used to sneaking around Mom and Dad by now. I smiled at Dad, saying, Sorry, Daddy. No need to be sorry, just go to bed. Good night, little star. Okay, Daddy. Good night, I said. When Dad was gone, Uncle Ori Callis reappeared next to me. That was a close one. Now, where were we? Oh, yes, you said you can't sleep without Avon. Isn't that the stuffed animal you always seem to have with you? Yeah, Mom said he needed to be washed because he was dirty. Daddy was supposed to hang him out to dry and forgot. I won't ever get to sleep, he said in a huff. He sat next to me, saying, How about I sing you a song to help you sleep? When I'm done, I'll keep watch over you for the night. Will that help? I smiled and nodded. You'd really do that for me? I'd do anything for you, Star. I'll always look after you and protect you from any danger. I stood up for a moment. Do you, Pinkie Pie, promise? He laughed lightly. Cross my heart and hope to fly. Stick a cupcake in my eye. I guess I've always known the Pinkie Pie promise. I think I would have recognized it when Wingnut did it. Huh. <sighs> guess that's a piece of my memory loss. When he was done, he smiled again. There. Now you have my unbreakable vow to watch over you forever. I laid back down. Good. Can you help me sleep? He cleared his throat. Anything for you, little star. Then he began to sing. Twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are. Up above the world so high. Like a diamond in the sky When this blazing sun is gone When the nothing shines upon When you show your little light Twinkle, twinkle through the night When the traveler's in the dark Thanks you for your tiny spark he could not see where to go If you did not twinkle so In the dark blue sky you keep 
And often throughout my curtains peep, For you never shut your eye Till the sun is in the sky. As your bright and tiny spark Lights the traveler in the dark, Though I know not what you are, Twinkle, twinkle, my little star. My eyes slowly started to close as he sang. When he finished, I murmured, I love you, Uncle Oricalis. Right before I fell asleep, I felt him kiss my cheek. I love you too, little one. Sleep tight. And remember, I am always watching over you from the darkness. I jumped as I woke. The memory of that night as fresh in my mind as if I'd just lived it. Aura woke too when I jumped out of her talons. Shadow. I rubbed my eyes and yawned. It was just a dream. I think it was a dream. Or a memory. Now you gonna be okay? Yeah. It wasn't a bad memory. It was from when I was still really young. It was something to do about my parents and... Well, Oricalis singing me a lullaby. The same one you were humming when I passed out. She yawned as well as she started to get up. As long as you're okay. Before either of us could get out of bed, I heard Gigi's voice from the doorway. <laughs> so you two are sleeping together. I guess I shouldn't be surprised. Aura rolled her eyes. Shut up, Mom. Gigi smiled. Why? I'm just stating a fact. Aura pulled on her saddlebags, then grabbed her spear. I don't need another lecture from you. Yeah, Shadow and I are together, but there's nothing you can do about it. I'm not in the Red Talons anymore. Gigi shrugged. I know that, Aura. But I thought you wanted to find a way back into the Talons. Not anymore. I'm happy with Shadow and the rest of our friends, Aura said, turning back to me. Come on, Shadow. Let's get going. I got up as well and started to put on my duster and barding. Where are we going? Aura pushed past Gigi, saying, The ceremony's gonna start soon, I'm guessing. I don't want to be late, and neither do you. Gigi let her pass. But when I tried to leave the room, she blocked my way. Aura. Can you go help Tonto? I'd like to talk to Shadow. Aura turned back towards her mother. I'm not gonna let you threaten her. It's okay, Aura. Go help Tonto. I'll be fine. I said. Yeah, Aura. She'll be fine. I'm not going to do anything. I just need to have a word with her, that's all. Geeky said. Fine. But don't take too long. Aura said before turning and walking down the hall. When she was gone, I asked, So, what's on your mind, Gigi? Gigi's face softened a little. So, when did it happen? A couple of days ago, back in the kingdom. Gigi smiled and chuckled. I'm glad to see that Aura's happy, though I do wish she'd lighten up a little. I'm guessing from her reaction that you didn't tell her what we talked about. You told me not to, and she never asked me about it. I do wish I could tell her, though. I think she'd feel better knowing that her mom doesn't care who she's with. I said. Gigi's smile faded. I agree. But at this point, I'm not sure she'd believe me about it. I just wish I could do something more for her. I feel like a bad mother by hiding my feelings like this. I also really have to think about what the rest of the Talons will think if they found out that I was okay with Aura breaking the rules. What I don't understand is why you can't just change some of the rules. You're the leader, and those rules or laws were written 200 years ago. It's not like I can't. But the problem is, if I did change the laws of the Red Talons, I could lose my position as leader. That would be bad for my family. Maybe. Or maybe you or Griffins would understand the rule change and go with it. It's not like you have to change all the rules. She sighed and leaned against the doorway. 
That's true. Honestly, I've been thinking about doing it for a while now. But with so much going on, I've been too busy to do anything. Well, all I'm gonna say is that I think it's a stupid rule. Is this all you wanted to talk to me about, or was there something else? I asked. No. What I wanted to talk to you about was that letter you had me to deliver to Trotston. With all that's happened since I left Spitfire's Flight Academy, I'd forgotten all about the two letters. What about it? Was there a problem with Trotston? Yes, no. Rusty was fine having a meeting with Javelin. We set up a contact. To have four wings of Griffins be at the meeting, and both sides have agreed to only send a few ponies, along with the leaders from both. The problem is, Rusty won't go to the meeting unless you're there. I frowned. Why me? She shrugged. He wouldn't tell us. All he said is that he wants the courier at the meeting to serve as the negotiator. I took a moment to think about it. I guess I could do that. I need to head out that way to see the doctor from the Annihilators and to look up a tip about Mom. The only thing I ask is that Rusty lets me sit down with him afterwards so I can talk to him about Wind Thrasher and a few other things. If he's willing to do that, then I'll help. Though I don't know what good it'll do. I don't know the first thing about being a negotiator. She smiled. Don't worry. I'll have Eris there as well. She specializes in negotiating. I'll make sure she gives you a few tips and sits down with you as well, so you can ask her for advice. I smiled. That'd be a good idea. So, when is this meeting? Rusty said that if you agreed, we could do the meeting in four days. We'll be meeting at the Crossroads Trading Post. It's a couple of miles south of Trotston. If you want, I can mark it on your pip buck for you, she said. I held out my hoof and let her set the marker. I'll do anything in my power to make sure I'm there. If something changes, just let me know. I'll keep my broadcaster ready so you can message me. Thank you, Shadow. Now, let's get going. The rain won't be the best time for us to start. Geeky said. As she turned to leave, I said, Geeky, for what it's worth, your youngest daughter is an amazing griffin. I'm lucky to have her by my side. Geeky stopped, then let out a long breath. She really is, Shadow. She's like me in that way. Take good care of her. There was a slight hitch in her voice when she said the last part. Geeky, are you okay? She started to walk away. I'll be fine, Shadow. I'll be just fine. When she was gone, I grabbed the rest of my stuff and headed back to the small living room. I found the stranger waiting for me. Are you ready for this? I mean, I'm not even sure what's going to happen, I said. What do you mean? In the stable, when a pony died, there was mostly just an announcement and a small get-together for the family. When Silver died, I didn't have any time to do anything. Wind Thrasher and I just buried her. I don't know what to do when a pony you cared for dies. To my surprise, the stranger moved closer to me and pulled me into a hug. You just need to be there. Remember the good times and forget the bad. Then you pray that his soul finds peace, either with the goddesses or whatever afterlife he believed in. That's all you can do. I found myself hugging him back. I can't believe he's gone. Just like that, one moment he was fighting like a badass, then he jumped in the way to protect me. And he f finally, he tricked out of his power armor only to die. He slowly let me go, saying, Shadow, you cared for box tape, right? I nodded. Yeah. That's why he did what he did. I'm sure in that moment he knew some pony was going to die. He made sure it was him, not you. I'm sure he thought of you as family. So he did what any father or grandfather would do when a filly is in trouble. I'm just tired of ponies dying to protect me. My dad, if he's still alive, silver, now box tape. Not fair. None of it is. He shook his head. Life's sense of humor can be cruel, Shadow. If it wasn't, my wife and filly would still be with me. 
Your mom would never have left you behind to do whatever she's trying to do. Hell, Equestria would still be a beautiful place and the war would never have happened. I know, I said. Come on. Let's go pay our last respects to a good stallion. The stranger said, taking my hoof and leading me towards the door. Just outside the door, Aura was waiting for me. They're ready to start. The stranger looked at Aura and back to me. I'll see you there. He left me with Aura. After he flew off, Aura said, What did Mom want? She wanted to let me know that there's going to be a meeting between the Annihilators and Trotston. I guess Rusty wants me there to help with the negotiations. I said as we both started walking past the destroyed buildings of Cartwheel. While I was out, it looked like the Griffins had cleaned up the bodies. All that was left was the blood from where their bodies had been. Shadow, remember we said no more secrets. Now, I know there was more to her talk than just that. She wouldn't have talked to you alone if that's all she wanted. Now spill. You won't believe me. Try me. I shrugged. She wanted to tell me that she's happy that you're happy. You're so funny. Now, tell me what she really said. Aura said, sounding annoyed. I just did. I told you you wouldn't believe me. Because my mom wouldn't say something like that. She hates the fact that I like ponies. Or maybe she's just saying that because she has to. I said. Shadow, I know my mom a lot better than you do. She's not that kind of griffin. She doesn't care about me as much as you think. I know you want every mom to love their daughters as much as your mom used to love you. I turned on her. Don't go there, Aura. Please. If you don't believe me, then fine. But I'm not lying to you. If you really want to know for sure, then go ask your mom. This is between you two. I can't keep being the pony in the middle of your family. I love you, Aura. And I'm not lying. She was a little shocked at my outburst. She really said that? Yes, and that's all I'm saying. Changing subjects, if Box Tape believed the same way as Griffin's, what does that mean for his funeral? I asked as we both started to walk again, heading towards the edge of town. It took a moment for Orr to answer. You remember what Tonto said about reincarnation, right? She asked. After I nodded, she continued. When a griffin dies, we want them to be able to move into the next life. Or into the afterlife if their soul has finished its journey in this world. To do that, the body of a griffin must be buried until it's nothing but ash. Only then will the griffin, or in this case, pony soul, move on to the next life or the afterlife. So you have your dead cremated? To put it simply... Yes. We just got outside of Cartwheel when I saw a gathering of griffins, a few ponies, and my friends. New graves had been dug, and some of the griffins were still burying some of the town ponies. To my surprise, I saw a few of the town's ponies of Cartwheel had escaped. I saw the old ghoul who I first met standing next to a couple of the shop owners. Most of the fillies and colts I'd saved from the raiders were standing with an older mare who ran the weapon store. Cartwheel may have been destroyed. A lot of ponies that lived there hadn't made it, but some of them were still alive. Sitting just off the road was a large stack of wood, built up into a square. Lying on top of it was Box Tape's body. Standing next to it was Tonto, Apollo, Gigi, and Vervain. Vervain was slowly running her hoof over her father's head, tears rolling down her cheeks as she looked at him. I made my way over and hugged her tightly. She hugged me back, saying, I'm glad you're here, sweetie. I'll always be here for Yanti Vervain. You know that. A moment went by, and I felt a talon on my shoulder. Pulling away from Vervain, I looked up to see the gentle smile on Tonto. It's time to start. Are you ready? Ready as I'll ever be, I said. Same for me, Vervain said. The ponies and griffins all started to gather around us as Tonto raised his talons into the air, saying... Thank you all for coming here this sad day. Today, we have all gathered here to say goodbye to the ponies who lost their lives during the attack that destroyed the town of Cartwheel. 
I know that most of you have lost brothers, sisters, fathers, mothers, and children. Tonight is a sad day for us all. Tonight is about remembering the ponies that we lost. No matter who we lost or who we didn't. We all knew Box Tape. He was the rock that Cartwheel was built upon. He was the face of the town. And he was in no small way the soul of Cartwheel. So, before we take time to say goodbye to the ponies we lost, we would like to pay our respects to Box Tape. Apollo spoke up next. I'll start. I first met Box Tape when I was young. A small job was working for the old buck. When we first met, I thought I was the best fighter around. I thought the old buck was nothing more than a forgetful old fool who wanted to be a courier. I was wrong. On that first mission, we were attacked by a group of raiders. There were far too many for me to take down on my own. But back then, when I thought, I was the best and tried to fight them off. If it wasn't for box tape, I wouldn't be talking to you today. I would have had my feathers torn out and died. I wouldn't have had my four wonderful children. He saved my life when I was overwhelmed. He fought them off like it was nothing. When it was all done, he told me something I'll never forget. He said, Never assume that you're the best. Even if you are. Even when the best have a bad day, or find someone who's stronger than they think. Always fight like your life depends on it, and never underestimate your enemies. Simply put, there's always some pony better. Those words changed the way I looked at the world, and I live by those words to this day. He was a good buck, a strong buck, a good friend. And he will be missed. May his soul find peace. Because as far as I'm concerned, Box Tape did more for this world than any pony ever has. Goodbye, my old friend. Not a single eye was dry as Apollo stepped away and Gigi moved closer to start on what she had to say. Before she did, I looked over at Aura. Why did your dad say four children? I thought there were five of you. Cindy... Vivranda, Gus, Fletch, and you. Aura looked down at me, whispering, I can tell you about it later, but for now I'll just say that Cindy isn't Apollo's daughter. Wait, she's... Aura interrupted me. Later. I shut my mouth as Gigi started to speak. I've known Box Tapes since I was little. He's always been a friend of the Red Talon. For as long as I can remember, he's always been around. When he was working with the Head and Sands, he used to hire us for harder jobs, or he would just stop by to visit. He was there for all of my children's hatchings. He was there when all of them passed their training. He was there for me when I lost Gale. In the past few years, I haven't had as much time as I used to, to come to Cartwheel. But before I was the leader, I used to visit him every week. We were close. He was like a second father. One regret is that I wish I could have taken more time over the past few years to see him more often. I'm going to miss him and his dirty jokes. Goodbye, my old friend. Once Gigi stepped down, the old ghoul came forward, saying, I was the first pony that wasn't part of the Steel Rangers to settle down in Cartwheel. I used to be a drifter before I came to town. I was close to becoming feral at the time. Box tape helped me when I was at my lowest, and talked to me like I was just another pony, and not the rotting corpse that most ponies think we are. He asked me what I used to do before the war. I told him that I used to sell different odds and ends. You know, a little bit of everything. He asked me if I'd like to stay in town and set up a general store. So that's what I did. I owe him for my sanity. And that's just what went on for the next hour. Different ponies who used to live in Cartwheel talked about how they met Box Tape, how he helped them, how good he was. 
Most of the Griffins went as well, each seeming to have either met Boxtape because of his friendship with the Red Talons, or he helped them join the Talons. Aura and her sisters had stories to tell about Boxtape, how they helped him in one way or another. Even Stardust had a few words to say about him. Tonto was told a long one, and a very funny story by Boxtape and him when they were kids. I guess Boxtape grew up near Crimson Canyon, and used to go on small adventures when back then as well. I guess they've been friends forever. And then it was finally my turn. I was the last pony to say something before Vervain. I looked out at all the ponies and griffins looking up at me with a lump in my throat, making it hard for me to say anything. I took a deep breath and started to speak. <clears throat> Hello, every pony and every griffin. I'm Shadowstar. Most of you know me as the Courier. I haven't known Box Tape for very long, but in that short amount of time, he became like a grandfather to me. It was because of Box Tape that was able to save the fillies and colts who were taken by the raiders. If it wasn't for him, I wouldn't have ever been called the Courier. I know that DJ Pony gave me that name, but it's only because of the duster given to me by Box Tape, and him giving me a job. However, after the Equestrian Express was destroyed, I told myself that I wasn't the Courier anymore. How could I be if there was no more Equestrian Express? But very recently I came to a realization. I took another deep breath, holding back some tears. The Courier isn't just a title bound to the Equestrian Express. Just because the building is gone doesn't mean its spirit is. No. The company that box tape and White Oak built won't die with him, or the place they called home. They'll live on in me. Before I used to hate the title that was forced upon me. But now I'm proud to call myself a Courier for Equestrian Express. Because I'm not just a courier. I'm the courier, like I said. It's no longer a title of when the next letter comes, but a title of hope in the wasteland. A beacon of light in the sea of shadows. Some pony we wastelanders can look up to, knowing that pony is trying to make the wasteland a better place. It's all because of box tape. He saved my life in more ways than one. He also made the ultimate sacrifice, to make sure that I'd live to see another day. He made sure I could keep doing what I do best. I'm the Courier Mayor, now and forever. Every pony and griffin started to cheer as I stepped away. I blushed a little as I went back to stand next to Aura and her family. Aura pulled me in close, saying, That was a great speech, Shadow. I wanted to say something to her, but instead I just sat back and listened to Ravain. She was still crying, but she managed to start. Thank you all for the kind words about my dad. Most of you know that my father and I didn't get along well over the years. But that doesn't mean I didn't love him. He was always very kind. Always there for me when I needed him. He used to say that when he was older, that he failed as a father. At times, I used to think the same thing, because he always wanted me to stay away from the work he did with the rangers. And that was where most of our disagreements came from. I wanted nothing more than to be like him and my mom. So I ran away and joined up with Los Alicorn. Later, my brother joined me. After mom died, I came home so I could be closer to dad. Even after then, I, all I did, he still didn't like that I was a steel ranger, even though he pushed Wolf Spain to join them. Ravain's voice started to crack, and she started to tear up as each word she spoke got harder and harder for her to say, taking breaths in between, making sure she got out what she wanted to say. I never understood why it was such a big deal, not until I met Shadow and her mom twelve years ago. I knew that I wasn't meant to put my mind to finding tech for the Steel Rangers or fighting with them, even though I was good at both. He knew that I was always meant to have a family. He wanted me to be able to enjoy my life in a way that he was never able to. Even though I found out that I couldn't have a foal of my own, the goddesses blessed me with Shadow Star. Sorry, Dad. I'm sorry that I didn't understand that until I was older. But thank you for always being there for me. 
thank you for pushing me to find the life I was always meant to have. I love you. I'll miss you. And I hope you find peace. If you see Mom, tell her that I miss her. After she was done, Vervain broke down. I ran over to her and helped her back to her hooves. I walked her back to sit next to Aura and I. Once she was better, Tonto walked over to Boxtape's body. He held a lit torch in one talon. Boxtape, sentinel of the hidden sands and steel rangers, protector and founder of Cartwheel, father, son, and friend. Your life has been long. It has been full of good and bad. You have done more for this land than any pony or griffin I have ever met. May your soul find peace in the lands of our ancestors. Yet if your soul isn't ready to move on, then we hope that your next life is full of peace, love, and happiness. Once Tonto said those last words, he placed the torch at the base of the wood. A moment later, a large blaze consumed the wood and the old buck. We sat there and watched as Boxtape's body was slowly consumed by the fire. I ignored the smell, ignored the sight. I just watched with Aura holding on to me as Boxtape was turned to ash. Right before the last of Boxtape's bones crumbled to ash, I said, Goodbye, Grandpa. For the rest of the day we spent with what was left of Cartwheel's citizens. I spoke to a lot of them, talking about ponies I met or never met. Once we were finished, my friends and I made our way back to Silver's house. Aura's mom joined us alone with Apollo. We were all sitting in the small living room now, talking about what's been going on since I left. For Nora's hearing, it wasn't good. The Romans had taken control of the river taken down four NLR bases, and were now pushing towards New Pegasus. The Steel Rangers that were now ran by Sapphire had taken down three more NLR camps, and Halo 1. They were also moving towards Trotston, but nobody knew why. The NLR were sending for reinforcements from out west, but they still hadn't shown up. There was also word about a dragon being spotted someplace near Stonefire Mountain. To top it off, the survivors of Appleton, who moved into Staple 14, had to had a contract out for me. Luckily, they contracted with a smaller Talon group that were allowed to work in the Red Talon area. But sooner or later, I was going to have to do something about them. So, what does this mean for me? I asked Gigi. It means that if you see griffins that aren't part of the Red Talons, bear prepared to fight or pay them off. The talent company's called Blackhawk. It's the name of their leader. She's a good griffin, but she also doesn't have the same values we do. In the Red Talons, most of our griffins can't drop a contract if the pony thereafter pays them off. Unless Apollo or myself says it's okay. Blackhawk's griffins don't care. They'll take a bribe to drop a contract. Though that doesn't mean they won't take another one from Appleton if they keep trying. Yee yeah, said. Can this not get any worse? I asked. It's okay, Shadow. I'm sure we'll find something out. Wingnut said. I smiled at him. Always the optimist, aren't you, kiddo? He beamed up. Some pony has to be in our family. Can I call us a family? I smiled and ruffled his mane a little bit. I'm fine with it. Whatever you say, boss, Nora said. Windthrasher was sitting next to Stardust, looking down and occasionally glancing over at him before answering Wingnut. I like the sound of a family. Stardust looked as if he was spacing out, like when he was talking about something or just looking bored. A family, huh? I don't care either way. I like the company around me. Apollo got up, saying, I really should get going. Stardust got up as well. Me too. I need to find out where Lonely Hearts and Sandstorm went. I didn't see them after the fight, and I'm getting worried. I'll go with you, Vervain said. I'm worried something happened to Sandstorm as well. I'll see you later, I said to Stardust, Vervain, and Apollo as they left. 
Yeah, I really should get going as well. It was nice to see you all, Gigi said, getting up as well. She looked over at Aura, saying, Aura, next week is the day of rebirth. I hope you'll be able to attend. As you know, it's the one day that even banished griffins can come back to Crimson Canyon. Aura, to my surprise, smiled a little, saying, Well, I didn't miss it for the world. That is, as long as my boss will let me go, that is. Wingnut looked up at that. What's a day of rebirth? It sounds dirty. Gigi laughed. It's the day we celebrate our founder. It's a day that we all get together and remember Greta and her life. Her son started the celebration to remember his mother and to give griffins that were banished a chance to get back into the talons. It's also the only day that griffins from other talon groups can join us. Sounds fun. We'll be there. Wingnut said with a smile. Good. Well then, I need to get home. Gigi said before turning towards the door. Wait, Mom. Aura said. Gigi stopped. Did you need something, Aura? Can we talk a few minutes before you go? Gigi hesitated for a moment, then her eyes fell on me. She glared at me for a long moment, then said, About what? I just need to know something, and I'd rather talk to you now while I can. Gigi sighed, then nodded. I'll give you a few minutes. Then I really need to head back. That's fine. Let's talk outside. Aura said, then followed her mom as she walked out the door. So, what do we do now? Wingnut asked. I'm not sure, kiddo. I don't even know where to go from here. Cartwheel's dead. Most of the town's ponies here are as well. The ones who are left may be able to rebuild, but that'll take time and caps, I said. Yaksha looked over at me, saying, I think we should take the next couple of days to rest up. From what has been going on, I am sure that you could all use it. I know I'd feel a lot better if we did, Windthrasher said. It's not like I have anything else to do for now. I think a couple of days of rest will be good, I said. The stranger looked over at me, saying, That'd be a good idea, Shadow. You've been going almost non-stop for days now. If you keep this up, you're going to regret it. It was also give me a time to teach you more, Shadow, Yaksha said. The stranger looked over at Yaksha. Teach her what? How to defend herself better, and I'm helping her get control of her magic. Does Shadow really need that much help with her magic? I mean, she's already pretty good, isn't she? Wing that asked. She comes from a line of strong and powerful unicorns, so I'd say so. The stranger said, I've seen what Shadow can do. Why would a zebra want to help her learn how to control her magic? Yaksha glared at him. She is powerful, yes, but she lacks control. If she is not careful, she may end up hurting herself someday. And that doesn't answer my question. Why are you helping her learn to control her magic? The stranger said in a low, dangerous voice. It is none of your business, Yaksha said. I am protecting her, so yes, it is, the stranger started to say. The voice of my uncle echoed out of my saddlebags and interrupted the stranger. Would you both shut up? I pulled the crystal out of my saddlebags, saying, Uncle Oricalis, how are you feeling? Better than I did before, he said the crystal pulsing a little as he spoke. Now, zebra, stranger, both of you shut up. The stranger took a step back. That can't be pride. Already callous now? I'm no longer pride. I've been helping Shadow ever since she almost killed me. I found out who she was during the fight. Now tell me, stranger. Why are you so worried about the zebra helping my niece? The stranger pointed a hoof at the gym. Why didn't you tell me he was still alive? Because I knew you'd act like this. He's been helping me and his family. Now answer his question. Yaksha chuckled to herself. Yes, stranger. Why do you not care who helps Shadow? You just showed up out of nowhere while Shadow was in the kingdom. Then you decided to join her so you could help her. 
I don't buy that for a second. I think you're up to something. I don't trust you, the stranger said. At least I show shadow my face. I am not hiding behind bandages like you, Pegasus. I think that you are one that she should not trust. I join Shadow because I am looking for an old friend who lives here. I decided to help her with her magic and with her fighting skill as payment for me helping get back. Yaksha said. Rikala spoke up. Zebra, I was in Shadow's sh shadow when you spoke to her at the kingdom. You had another reason for joining her. Wingnut spoke up this time. Why else would she want to join us? It's not like she's a friend to Shadows or anything. She just wanted a ride back to New Pegasus. That's it. Oricalus laughed. Wrong, child. She told Shadow that she knows what lives inside my niece. Everyone's eyes fell on Yaksha, who then blushed. Miami Zebra. Of course I can feel the presence that lives within Shadow. Any zebra that is trained properly can do the same. And that is another reason I want to help her gain control of her magic, so she can learn how to hold back that creature that lives inside of her. The stranger growled. Really? You expect me to buy that too? I had enough. I took a deep breath and then yelled. All of you shut the fuck up! Stranger, she saved my life in the absent ruins, and I trust her, so you should too. Yaksha... The stranger has been a great ally to me, and more than once, and he didn't have to. I trust him too, so drop it. Yaksha sighed. Let it be known that I did not escalate the tension. He did. She pointed at the stranger. For a long moment, no one said a word. Finally, Wind Thrasher broke the silence. Stranger, I'm surprised you're still down here. That seemed to snap him out of whatever mindset he was in. With Wolfsbane's attack on cartwheels, Stratus is on high alert. Nightshade told me to stay with Shadow for a few days to make sure she was still safe. He'll figure something out as to why I'm not up there. So I guess you're going to be staying here for a while then, huh? Wingnut asked. Yes, I will, as long as Shadow doesn't mind. He said. I shrugged. I don't mind, as long as you stop trying to fight with Yaksha or Orikalis. The stranger sighed. I guess I can let it go for now. But I'll be keeping an eye on your training and that zebra. Yaksha rolled her eyes. As long as you do not get in the way. Shadow, come with me so we can start. I shrugged. Looks like Aura's going to be talking with Gigi for a bit longer. So I guess I can find something to do. Windthrasher, why don't you try and sleep? Wingnut, see if there's anything of the town ponies that need help with. They both nodded. Once they were gone, I followed Yaksha to the room I shared with Aura, the stranger close behind. Okay, we will start with going back to your meditations. This time, I want you to try and dig deeper into your mind. I want you to see if you can find a way to draw out on the power from that monster inside of you without it taking over control. I stopped. That doesn't sound safe. It is not, but I have a way to make sure that you will succeed. She said as she moved to sit in the middle of the room, the stranger sitting a few feet away watching us. I noticed Yaksha was sitting on her rear, with her hind legs crossed strangely, her forehooves resting on her rear legs and pointing out. That looks uncomfortable. Shadow, I know that you are hesitant. But it is necessary for you to do what I'm about to teach you. Now, copy my gesture as best as you can, Yaksha said. I tried to mimic what she was doing, but I kept falling over. I'm not a zebra, I can't do that. She sighed and moved over to help me. You can, Shadow. You are just too tense. You need to relax more. She kept moving my legs and forehooves until I was sitting the same way she had been. Good. Now, I want you to eat this. I saw she was holding out something that looked like a large raisin. What is it and why should I eat it? Stop acting like a fool and eat it. It is something I cooked up. It will help you enter your own mind. It will also help me do the same. I'm going to see what this creature is, and I will help you take hold of its power. Now, enough with the 20 questions, Shadow. 
Do you want better control of your magic, or do you want to continue blasting wildly and hope you hit your mark? I wrinkled my nose a little as I took hold of the... whatever it was, then tossed it in my muzzle. I almost threw up. It tasted like ass. Even worse, it was chewy and had a soft, nasty goo inside. After a minute, I was able to get it down. Once I did, Yaksha ate one too. When she was done swallowing, I asked, Now what? Now I want you to clear your mind and meditate the same way I showed you in this guy carriage. I closed my eyes and started to breathe deeply. I threw what Yaksha had showed me before and soon found my body starting to relax. Then I heard Yaksha say, Good. Now I'm going to draw something on your chest. Do not worry about what I am doing. Just keep breathing. The stranger said, Don't do anything weird that'll hurt her. I will not. Just make sure that you watch over her. If she starts to panic, splash water over her or rub away the glyph, Yaksha said. As I breathed in and out slowly, I felt Yaksha paint something on my chest. Whatever she was using to do it smelled like mint mixed with sage. As Ryoma flowed over me, a tingling started in my belly. The feeling expanded and soon I felt it over every inch of my body. Then Yaksha started to chant in what sounded like zebra. Soon the sound filled the room and I could tell that whatever she was doing wasn't just simple exercise. This must have been zebra magic. Before I could ask her what she was doing, everything around me seemed to vanish. At first, I thought Yaksha had somehow sent me into one of my own memories. I realized that I knew where I was. I'd only been there once, back when I thought I killed Pride and my mind was split. The little white unicorn had used a spell to go into the dark unicorn's mind where she found Aquila. This was the deepest part to my mind. Everything was white and power seemed to fill the space like an overflowing river. I tried to take a step forward, and noticed that my hooves were in a thin layer of water. In front of me there was a small cage made out of what looked like old rusty steel. Inside the cage was a white filly with a black mane, moving stars on her flanks. She was sleeping right now, a small snore escaping her muzzle with each breath. I took a few steps forward, wondering if this was Aquila's true form or just another trick. Do not get too close to her just yet, Shadow, I heard Yaksha say. I almost jumped. Turning, I saw the zebra was only a few feet away from me. Don't scare me like that. I am sorry, Yaksha said as she moved to stand next to me, looking down the cage. So, this is the creature. Strange, she looks like a filly to me. But I can also see that she is full of power. What is her name? Aquila. At least, that's what she told me. Aquila, huh? The eagle, the protector, the great hunter of the stars. Strange that she would take on that name. The stars of the Aquila constellation have always been known as good stars. They protect the land and bring good luck. They would never make a creature that would want to take over a pony. She was named by Manette. In the notes I found about her, she was created. Minette said the constellation was shining brightly in the sky that night. Yaksha looked confused. What do you mean, created? She was made in a lab. It was called Project Stargazer? No, that project was scrapped, deemed a failure. Even if it was not, there was no way they could have created something like her. It was my turn to look confused. What do you mean? Shadow, that creature is not the sum creation of a lab. She is a child of the stars. She is what is known by my ancestors as star spawn. A star spawn? I thought those were just demons that the stars created to cause problems for ponies or zebras on Equus. She shook her head. In most of our beliefs, that is true. Evil stars do like to make trouble when they can. The creatures they are make are not as powerful as they could be, but they do manage to do a lot of damage. A true star spawn like Aquila here is made by a child of the stars. The stars themselves give some kind of their own power and life to make one. When they do this, the creature they make normally becomes a new star in the heavens. 
They never send a child of the stars to Equus, because they cannot take form in this land. They are pure light magic. The only way they could live here is if they take over a host. But no pony can handle that much power, and it kills them. But that's what she said she was doing with me. Using my body to stay alive until she can take me over. You mean to tell me that no pony has ever lived through an encounter like this? I said, my eyes glued on Aquila's sleeping form. There are only a couple of stories that I know that involve Children of the Stars taking over hosts like this. Two zebras a long time ago had this happen to them. They both died within days of the bond. Same for those Children of the Stars. And this is why the stars do not send their children down here. Not the good ones, that is. The evil stars will do something like this sometimes. But dark stars cannot make a creature like Aquila. So the pony or zebra they take over just becomes a twisted evil monster until they are put down. Yaksha said. So you mean that when Aquila takes over we'll both die? Most likely. There is only one pony I know that has ever lived through something like this. Who was that? I do not remember the pony's name, but I do know that he was a powerful unicorn that served in the Old Kingdom, before Equicestria was founded. He lived through the bond, at least his body did. The pony of the child of the stars became something else, when he was fully bonded. He became the creature you know as Discord. Nyaxa said as she walked around the cage Aquila was trapped in. I remember hearing stories about Discord in my classes in Stable 28. He was a trickster or something, wasn't he? The Spirit of Chaos, she said as she stepped on one side of Aquila. Is there any way from, to get her out of me? I asked. I am not sure. From what I know, you two have been bonded for a long time. It is a miracle that you have been able to hold her off for so long. Mom caged her for a few years, I think that helped. She wasn't able to do much until I found the Mark II. Anyway, oh, this is fascinating and all, but why are we really here? I asked. As I said before, I want to find a way for you to be able to draw on her power without her taking over. Again, that sounds dangerous. Even if you could help me draw on her power, how would this help me control my magic? She grinned. Aquila has a lot of knowledge about magic. Most creatures like her do. Since they are made of light magic and created by stars, they are ancient themselves. They gain a vast amount of knowledge during this creation. When you draw on her power without her trying to control you, that knowledge will be yours. At least some of it will. A small amount of her power will help you in your own abilities and grow them, and give you better control. That sounds really far-fetched. How do you even know if any of this is real? What if I can't control the power I take in, or it makes it easier for her to break out? I know this, because she needs a lot of her power to break out of a cage like the one she is in. If she does, she will still need more than power to fully take control of you. Even more so without killing you both. If you take that power from her, she will not be able to get free. If by some miracle she does break free, she will not have enough power to take you over. I looked over at Aquila again and asked, so if I can do this, I'll be able to hold her off forever? That is what I am hoping for. So no matter what I do, I'll always have her inside of me. She'll always be there to mock me from the depths of my mind. At first, yes. But you see, you are missing another part of what makes her strong. She is slowly drawing power from your body, from your own magic. If you do what I am saying, over time... You may be able to reverse the flow. By doing this, my hope is that she will be so weak that one day she will not be able to talk to you anymore, or she may even fade from existence. So she die? She cannot truly die, for she is not truly a living creature, just magic with a personality. You could think of her as dying, when in reality it is just reserved magic. That sounds... terrible. Maybe. But you have to remember that the Quilla is trying to take over your body. This is the only way that I can help you, Shadow. Yaksha said. I know, I just don't like it. I know she's trying to take over, but sometimes I feel like there's more to it than that. There is not. 
Trust me. How do you know she really is a child of the stars and not some sort of creation from Stargazer? I asked. Yaksha laughed. Shadow, I am a zebra. I can tell that she is a true child of the stars just by looking at her. Now, we should get started. This trance will not last much longer. Okay, what do I need to do? I asked. It is simple. Do you see that glow around her? I nodded. Yeah? I want you to concentrate your magic on that, and try and pull as much of it towards yourself as you can. That's it? I asked. Yes. Now, when you start, it will feel like you're in a game of tug-of-war. Since this is your mind and not her own, you will be stronger. Just keep pulling until you feel the power around her flowing into you. Okay, I said. I concentrated on the magic around Aquila's sleeping form. As soon as my telekinesis touched the glow around her, I felt a shock run up my magical field and through my body. As soon as that happened, I felt as if my life force was being drained away, following the magic's path back to Aquila. Remembering what Yaksha said, I put all my will into pulling that power back into myself and away from Aquila. For a long, tense moment, nothing happened. Then the drain on my life force stopped and slowly started to return. Its flow was slow at first, like water trickling down a rock. And then it came faster. Soon the energy was being pulled away from me, and now I was drawing power around Aquila. Like when I took the power she stole from the power source, it didn't hurt. The power was stored and started to flow into me from Aquila. It felt natural. And that is it, Shadow. Just a little more, Yaksha said. As soon as Yaksha spoke, Aquila's eyes opened. The flow of power stopped as Aquila slowly got to her hooves. Her eyes glued on mine. A look of pure anger on her face. What the hell do you think you're doing? I tried to cut off my spell, but I couldn't. Aquila was holding on to my telekinesis. Let me go, Aquila. It's bad enough that I have to be trapped inside this fucking cage your mother made. Now you have the fucking guts to come in here and try and steal what little power I have left? As she yelled, the area around us seemed to darken. You're one to talk. You want to take over my body. Because you made a deal with me, Shadow. Five to ten years you'd get to live, to do what you wanted. After that time, when I got your body. You only had a week or so left to live. I gave you ten years. You owe me. I was a child. I didn't understand what I was doing. I yelled back. Shadow, you must break the spell so we can leave. Before she takes your power, Yaksha said. Aquila looked over at Yaksha, saying, This is between me and Shadow. You get your filthy mind out of here. While Aquila was distracted, I cut the flow of magic. Severing my connection to Aquila, I backed away from the cage and said, Let's get out of here, Yaksha. No, I'm not letting you leave until you give me back what you stole, Aquila yelled. Power erupted from her, blasting out from her cage and rolling over us like a blast of hot air. Shadow, you need to get us out of here, Yaksha yelled. How? The room around us went black, and Aquila's presence seemed to grow. Her cage started to crack. I'm not letting you keep me trapped in here. It's time you pay me what you owe! Yaksha jumped in front of me and started to chant something. For a moment, something started to go back to normal. I took another step back. Yaksha, how do I get us out of here? She didn't respond. She was too busy doing whatever she was trying to do. Aquila looked like she'd been hit with a bat for a moment. Then her expression changed to rage. Be gone! An explosion of power erupted from her cage. Yaksha stopped her chanting and only for a moment to say, No! The blast of power slammed into Yaksha. She screamed and vanished into a puff of smoke and light. The blast stopped, leaving only Aquila and myself. What did you just do? I banished her from our mind, Shadow. That zebra thinks she knows what I am. She thinks she knows how to stop me. The thing is, she has no idea what she's gotten herself into. 
No matter how much power you take from me, no matter how much control you have over your magic, you can't stop me. She said as she started to laugh. I told you, Shadow. We are one. I'm not losing myself to you, Aquila. I'm not giving up. I will find a way to get rid of you. Another crack appeared in her cage. Shadow, we are bonded. We have been for ten years. Nothing you can do can get rid of me. Not unless I decide to break our deal, and I won't. Even now, I'm slowly destroying this cage your mother's magic trapped me in. In a week, maybe two, I'm breaking free, and I'm taking over. Right then, something seemed to click inside my head. It was like someone had jammed a small spell book into my mind, and spells I've seen my mom do back when I was young, and even magic she used to make the cage around Aquila made sense to me. I grinned, and as calmly as I could, I said, That's where you're wrong, Aquila. This is still my head. My mind. I control what happens here to you. Really? And what do you think you knew to stop me? This. I was in my own head. I didn't have to cast a spell using my horn or anything. This entire place is nothing more than a projection of my mind. I don't have to cast a spell because my magic was already inside of me. All I had to do was redirect the flow of power and bend it to my will. The room around us turned white again, and the look of condescending rage vanished on Aquila's face. The cracks in her cage vanished, her glow around her faded, and she seemed to shrink in size. What did you just do? Made sure you can't get free for a long time. You can fight with Mom's magic, but you'll have a harder time fighting mine. I'll find a way to get you out of me, Aquila. I promise you that. I said, smiling at her. I felt something wet it was just splashed across my chest and stomach. The world around me started to fade. Yaksha or the stranger must have done something to pull me out. As I felt myself being taken back, Aquila chuckled. This won't work as well as you think, Shadow. You made a mistake by coming here. <laughs> I woke up to find myself looking at Yaksha and the stranger. What the hell happened? I asked. I was going to ask the same thing. One minute you two are sitting there, the next Yaksha wakes up screaming, the stranger said. That thing blasted me out of Shadow's head. She should not have been able to do that, Yaksha said. I got up slowly. Well, whatever happened, I stopped her. Both of them looked shocked, Yaksha asking, How did you do that? I'm not sure. All I know is I did something and it stopped her. Shadow, I need to know what you did. Yaksha said, looking concerned. I don't know, I yelled. My head hurts right now, can you please drop it? She may have done something to trick you. I need to know. Yaksha said. The stranger pushed her back, saying, Leave her alone, she needs rest. Pegasus, you do not understand what is happening. I know more than you think. Right now she's tired. You've put her through enough. Talk to her tomorrow, the stranger said. Yaksha looked pissed. Fine, but if something happens, it is on you, Pegasus! She stomped away and back to the room she was sharing with Ravane. When she was gone, I sighed. Thank you, stranger. No need to thank me. You should get some rest. We can talk tomorrow, he said. Good idea. If you see Aura, tell her I'm laying down, okay? I said, getting to my hooves. As I did, I felt something wet on my stomach. Looking down, I saw that water had been splashed on me. The glyph there was nothing more than running red paint. I'll tell her. He said, going to lay down on the couch. I set my stuff down in one corner and laid down. It didn't take me long to fall asleep. I'm not sure how long I was out, but sometime later I was woken by Aura. At first it was just a touch on my shoulder as she slowly shook me. Turning over, I opened my eyes to see her looking down at me, tears in her eyes. Aura? Are you okay? She didn't answer me. She moved her head down and kissed me. For a long moment, she held me there. Then she pulled away and crawled into the bed. 
She didn't say anything as she kissed me again, her talons rang down my body. When she moved her beak down to my neck, I panted. Aura, what's wrong? Just don't say anything, please. So I didn't. I laid back and held onto Aura as she worked herself down my body. I held onto her as she did her best not to cry. I just let her do what she wanted. I'm not sure what was on her mind, but I didn't know that she needed me. In that moment, we embraced each other in various ways. Or I didn't tell me what was wrong. All she would say, as I laid there in her arms, was, I love you, Shadow. Over the next two days, things started to look up in Cartwheel. The town was still destroyed. Only a few ponies survived the attacks. But the Red Talons were already helping the ponies that survived. They were going to help them move to the abandoned town outside of Crimson Canyon. The next morning, I felt a lot better, and was able to tell Yaksha what happened with Aquila and me. She didn't say much, but she still looked worried. She did, however, keep training me on how to control my magic. I was now able to use my spells a lot easier ever since I took some of her power. The knowledge I thought I gained when I was still in my own mind seemed to have vanished, but Yaksha said it would take some time for me to understand what had happened. The stranger started to work with Yaksha to teach me how to hoof-to-hoof -hoof fight, and how to handle my weapons better. Aura also joined in to help me learn how to use the sword I found as well. Vervain and Stardust had arrived back in Cartwheel the next day with Lonely Heart, Sandstorm, and her sky carriage. We spent some time to bury the bodies of the Steel Rangers who were all in the carriage. Sandstorm said that once the attack went down, he got Lonely Hearts away from the town as quick as he could. Lonely Hearts was able to tell me a little more about what he learned about Mom. Most of it was information I already knew. One thing stood out that I found interesting. Mom had been spotted in New Pegasus four days ago, going into the NLR embassy. So either she was still in the area, or she was already heading back to La Zolicorn. I was going to have to talk to one of the LNR higher-ups when I had some free time. Vervain decided to join the rest of Cartwheel as they headed towards Crimson Canyon. She said they'd need a mare like her if they were going to survive. So, on the third day after the death of Box Tape, we had to say our goodbyes to the town ponies who lived. We were now heading east towards Crossroads Trading Post, so we'd make it in time for the meeting. The stranger was still traveling with us. He just told me that he was ordered to keep an eye on me. We would have taken the sky carriage, but Bervain said we shouldn't fly anywhere just in case the Los Alicorn branch was still around. Keeping to the ground was safer at the moment, so one of the Talons took the sky carriage with them to keep it safe in Crimson Canyon. Now, Stardust, Wingnut, Windthrasher, Aura, Yaksha, the stranger, and I we're walking across the dry land, getting closer to Halo 1. We were taking the long way around it to keep clear of both the hidden sands and the power plant. I didn't know what was going on with Sapphire, but I didn't have time to deal with her right now. When I was finished with this meeting and going back to Crimson Canyon for this rebirth celebration, then I'd make a trip to Hidden Sands and talk with Elder Sapphire. I'm tired! Wayne not complain for the fifth time now. I know, kiddo. But we have a lot of miles to cover, and I'd like to get there before everybody else shows up. I said. I know, but do we have to walk? We have like four ponies who can fly. Can't they just carry us there? No way, kiddo. Stardust said. We aren't just here to carry you from place to place. Also, it's good for you to walk. Says you, you fly everywhere, Wingnut complained. Not everywhere. Plus, a Pegasus needs to fly to keep our wings in shape, Stardust said, coming to land next to Wingnut. Also, he's keeping an eye out for enemies, Aura said. Yaksha was a little ways ahead of us, talking on that portable broadcaster of hers. She's been doing that most of the day, but when we asked what she was talking about, she refused to say... The stranger sighed, saying, I don't like it when she keeps talking to some pony like that. Same here, but I'm sure she's not going to do anything to us. She's been nothing but helpful since we first met her. I said, yawning. I don't know, Shadow, I'm with the stranger on this, Aura said. 
Yaksha, for the last time, who are you talking to? Yaksha looked back at us. My contact. He is just making sure that I am okay, is all. And who is this contact? Or I asked as we got closer. He is just a friend. Some pony I have traveled with in the past. You do not need to worry. He is a good stallion. He is waiting for me in Coven. It is just south of where you are going, she said. Fine, but can you stop walking off? You don't have to walk away just to talk to your friend, I said as I passed by the older zebra. My apologies, Shadow. I will not do so again. Since you are up here, may I indulge in you for a moment, she said. I guess so, it's still a long walk. What would you like to know about? I am under the impression that I am not trusted among your friends. It is a bit disheartening. Have I not been nothing but helpful? Honestly, Yaksha, I'm beginning to think I'm the only one who does trust you. That is... saddening to hear. Well, you have been secretive about the friend you talk so much about. Why haven't you talked to about him more? Yaksha sighed. I have not talked about him much because he prefers to be secretive. He trusts very few ponies. I am the only one he regularly keeps in contact with. Because he does not need to hide himself from me. I have proven that to him numerous times. It is only natural that he wants me to make sure that I am okay. Is that not how friendship works? It's still a little shady, Yaksha. Or interrupted. No pony asked you, Griffin. She glared. Yaksha, it doesn't help that you treat almost any pony rudely. It also only seems natural to have some sort of mistrust. I said with a sigh. I am sorry, Shadow. I have always been naturally defensive. It has gotten better over the years after meeting that mare you told me about. But it is just that I do not want to feel outcast again by a group of ponies like I did back in Coven years ago. It brings back bad memories. I can kind of understand. Being the only unicorn at an all-earth pony stable can make you feel like an outcast as well. She smiled at that. Thank you, Shadow Star. It does make me feel a little better. She stopped for a moment, as if in thought. You know, I have been to Crossroads Trading Post a few times before. I wonder how much it has changed over the years. She blushed a little. I wonder if Black Licorice still works there too. You were? I asked. Yes, I was. It was one of the first major stops that the mare I told you about and I went to when we were doing a major favor for Silverlight. That favor led us around most of the Marave, and eventually to an underwater stable. I perked at that. An underwater stable? What was that like? The details are a little fuzzy. There were a lot of experiments on marine life. But turn for the worst, at least from what I remember. She stopped again and smiled once more. Thank you again, Shadowstar, for letting me indulge. I'll try not to be so secretive next time if I will earn your friend's trust. I smiled at that. I'm glad I can help you feel a little bit more comfortable. The rest of the day we spent making our way through the drylands. Our destination was on the other side where one of the major highways ran north to south. Once we reached that, we could use it to reach Crossroads Trading Post. My plan was for us to reach the cliffs near the road by nightfall, then camp out before we continued on. Luckily, we reached the cliffs as a light was just starting to fade from the cloudy sky. I'll set up camp and get dinner started, Stardust said as he headed in for the overhang on the side of the cliff. Checking my pit buck, I looked over the map. Looks like this road is just on the other side of the cliffs, but I don't see a crossing to get through. There's one a mile or so north of here. We can head for it to mile tomorrow, Ora said as she went to help Stardust. I'm going to go check the area, make sure there are no nasty critters around here, the stranger said. Ora walked over to me. Shadow, 
Go with the stranger. He's been walking in the heat all day, and I'm afraid he's going to pass out. Keep an eye on him, and make sure he drinks some water. You sure? He seems like he's doing better now. Yeah, I feel better knowing some ponies with him. Can I go? Wingnut asked. I was about to say no, but I always seem to make him stay behind. You know what? I'd like the company. Come on. Awesome! Wingnut said, following me as I headed in the direction of the stranger. It didn't take long for me to catch up. Wingnut not far behind. The stranger looked back and sighed. You don't have to come with Shadow. Or you either, Wingnut. Maybe, but Aura's worried that you might not be doing so well as you say. So I'm going to make sure you don't pass out, and also that you drink some water. I said, passing him one of my canteens. He chuckled a little. Yes, I'm just not used to having other ponies with me. He took the canteen. Thank you, Shadow. Wingnut walked over to the stranger, asking, You feeling okay? You look sad. Honestly, kid, I'm just tired. It's not easy walking in this heat while wearing all this gear. The stranger said. Even his voice sounded tired. Then why don't you just take it off? I mean, you can still keep that mask on, but at least you'll be able to cool off if you take off the jacket and the armor. Wingnut said. Maybe I'll do that when we're back in camp, he said. For now, I'll just keep this on, in case we're not in any trouble. I was scanning the area, looking for any red bars showing up on my EFS. I'm not seeing anything, honestly. I'm not surprised. Normally, you only see things like fire geckos or huge ants, but not much else. Though, every once in a while, you'll find hellhounds around here. I'd feel better sleeping knowing there weren't any of those monsters wandering around. If hellhounds were around here, you wouldn't see them coming, Wingnut said. They would just jump out of the ground and kill you. That's what they're good at. I looked down at the hard ground. Wait, you mean hellhounds can just pop out of the ground without warning? The stranger and Wingnut looked back at me, Wingnut asking, Did you ever fully read that Wasteland Survival Guide? Even Yaksha mentioned hellhounds breaking down entire cities surrounded by stone. Most of it? Really? He asked. Come on, it's not like I've ever had time to go through the whole thing. Also, stuff is missing in mine, and I haven't had time to go through Wind Thrashers, I said defensively. You really should read it. I'm surprised you're still alive, Wingnut said with a laugh. The stranger chuckled too. So am I. Oh, you both can kiss my ass, I said. They both laughed, and the stranger said, Things are looking fine out here. We should do a sweep closer to the cliffs, then head back. Not a bad idea, I said. We were almost back to the cliffs when the stranger stopped, his ears perking up. Did you hear that? Wingnut and I looked around as I said, I didn't hear anything. Same here, Wingnut said. It sounded like some pony reloading a battle saddle. Only it was far away, he said, still looking around. His hoof came up to one of the gems embedded in the lining of his jacket, ready to tap it. I was moving my head around, looking for anything, when a white line showed up on my EFS. It was a little to the side of the stranger and Wingnut. Some ponies out there. Boom. The stranger tapped his gem right before the gunshot went off. There was a flash of blue light, and the next thing I knew, Wingnut and I were a few feet away from where we'd just been standing. The hole was in the ground, right where I stood a moment ago. The stranger was standing next to me, panting. Close. Both of you, get out of here now. A voice that reminded me of a ghoul, not only as bad, echoed above us. Looks like you still have a few tricks up your sleeve, Guardian. We all looked up and watched as a pegasus dove and landed a few feet away from us. The stranger pulled out his revolver, saying around the bit, Who the hell are you? This pegasus had his head covered with a hood and a cloak, but he wore black combat armor with a few jewels on his chest. His face was covered by a scarf, and he had goggles over his eyes. I pulled out Dreamwalker. Buddy, you messed with the wrong ponies. He turned his head towards me, saying, 
I think not, Carrier. A gem in his combat armor flashed, and a moment later it felt like some pony just ripped my horn right off. My magic broke, and Dreamwalker fell to the ground. Shadow! Wingnut said, running over to me. The Pegasus didn't seem to care. He lifted his wings, revealing a battle saddle with two long guns on it. He pointed them right at Wingnut and me, saying, Courier, stay down and shut up. If you don't, I'll kill you. I don't know who you are, but you'll pay for that, the stranger said. Oh, I don't think so. I've been trying to find you for a long time, Guardian. You're a hard pony to track down. The Pegasus said. Now, drop that demon slayer before I blow this mare's head off. How do you know what my revolver is called? The stranger said, taking a step back. Who are you? The Pegasus pulled the goggles he was wearing off his face, revealing bright green eyes just like the stranger's. I think you know who I am, brother. The stranger didn't move. You can't be him. He's dead. Yeah, I should have died. But fate wanted me kept alive. I'm the Eleventh Guardian. And I'm here to put an end to what you and the Enclave are doing. And to put a stop to this monster. He said, pointing a hoof at me. She has the power of Stargazer. Something that no pony should have ever found. You've been doing a poor job of keeping our family secret. Who the hell are you? I yelled. No pony courier. Just like that poor excuse for a stallion you call the stranger. He's been protecting me. He's a good stallion. He laughed, his voice sounding like rocks were scraping together. No, he's not. He couldn't even save his own family. His filly died because of him. His wife left because of him. He can't protect anything, courier. Now... Be quiet, and let me deal with my brother. I'll deal with you when I'm finished. No way, I yelled. Shadow, stay out of this. If it really is my brother, then I have to settle the score. Get back to your friends. No ponies going anywhere. If you try to leave, I'll stop you, the Pegasus said. Men don't even think about teleporting away. That gem I used will keep your magic down for half an hour or so. This is between us. Leave Shadow and the kid out of this, the stranger said. Yeah, if we aren't back soon, my friends will come looking for us, I said. The Pegasus laughed. No, they won't. Yaksha is keeping them distracted while I take care of this. We are far enough away that they won't notice anything till it's too late. Now sit down and shut up before I make you. I don't care who you are. I'm not letting you get away with this, the stranger said. We couldn't help but watch as the Pegasus walked closer to the stranger, saying, Eighteen years you've been protecting the project, and you still couldn't stop Grimm from getting to Stargazer, could you? You never left me with enough information, damn it. I didn't even know Stargazer was anything until recently. If you would have just given me the information I needed when you were branded, I would have known what to do, the stranger said. If you would have just gone to my hideout, you would have found everything you needed. Fuck. I trusted you to protect it. Now everything's going to shit because of you. The Pegasus said. Then he attacked. He didn't fire his guns. Instead, he flipped around and kicked the stranger right in the face. The stranger did a backflip, then darted at the other Pegasus, trying to land a blow on his face. The Pegasus ducked under that blow, and landed another one in Stranger's chest. He took hold of one of Stranger's wings and used it to slam into the ground. What happened to you, little brother? Last time I saw you, you were a better fighter than this. The Stranger used his hind legs to kick the other Pegasus off of him. Then he attacked again, lending a blow on the newcomer's face. I've still got a trick or two. The two kept going at it, trading blow for blow. As they fought, I looked over at Wingnut. Try and get back to camp. If what he said's true, Yaksha can't be trusted. Tell Oro what's going on. What about you? He asked. I'll be fine. Now go. Wingnut nodded and made a run for it. 
He only got a few feet away when the stranger was slammed into the ground in front of Wingnut. The Pegasus landed a few feet away. I said no ponies leaving until I'm finished. The stranger struggled to get back to his hooves. Leave them alone. The Pegasus bucked the stranger. Pathetic. To think that Dad used to say that you were a better fighter. Seems life in the clouds has made you go soft. His gaze moved towards me. His eyes, so much like the stranger's, it was eerie. Yaksha said that you have the power of Aquila in you, is that right? I don't know you, so why should I tell you anything? I said. I don't even know why I'm asking. Yaksha already told me about how powerful Aquila's become. I'm sorry, young mare, but you have to die. It's the only way to stop her. He said, aiming his rifle right at me. Striker, stop! You don't know who this is! The stranger yelled. Be quiet, brother. I know exactly what I need to know. She has been to be stopped. She's Grimm's daughter! The stranger yelled. The Pegasus froze, then looked back at him. Grimm told me that she died. She said that she tried to use Stargazer to save her, and the power got away from her. This can't be Star. Wait a second. Stryker? L like my father's brother, Stryker? I said, like I felt someone just slap me. I thought Stryker was killed in an explosion. The Pegasus looked between the stranger and me and said, I don't buy it. Nice try, brother. But I know that Star is dead. He aimed at me again and bit down on the bit in his battle saddle. No! The stranger yelled. He tapped his gem again, and in a flash of blue light, he vanished. The Pegasus' rifles went off. There was another flash of blue light as the stranger appeared in front of me, taking the bullets in one side. I watched as blood shot out. The stranger's body flew into me, sending us both flying back. The Pegasus swore. Damn it, brother. That was stupid. I meant to give you a beating, not kill you. The stranger coughed, then said, Maybe. But I won't let you hurt her. Then he pulled out a flash bomb and threw it at the Pegasus, then covered me with his body to protect me from the light, yelling, Wingnut! Run for it! There was a flash of light, and I heard the Pegasus yell right as Wingnut ran. A moment later, the stranger was pulling me off and thrown back to the ground. The Pegasus, who sounded like a ghoul, started to slam his hooves into the stranger, yelling, You're a fucking fool, brother. Now I'm going to kill you, then I'm going to kill that mare. I'm going to finish you, which you should have started weeks ago. I wanted to help, but my magic was useless. I could try to fight, but I still wasn't as good as a fighter as the stranger, and he lost his, his Pegasus to Stryker. Was he really the uncle that every pony said died? If so, then who was the stranger? He said he wasn't my dad, so he was another brother I never heard about. Then I watched Stryker slam his hooves into the stranger. I saw that something had fallen out of his pocket. It was a stuffed bird I'd seen him pull out before in an old photo. I reached out with my hoof and pulled them close. I looked at the photo first. It was a picture of Mom holding a foal in a white coat and a black mane. She was looking down at the foal with so much love in her eyes that it was beautiful. I picked up the stuffed bird. As I did, something about it seemed familiar. I pulled it to my nose and a faint scent came off the bird. Avon? Something snapped in my head. It was like the last of Mom's spells that kept me from remembering my father broke. Daddy, you look silly in that hat, I said as I sat on his bed. He was just finishing putting on the outfit he used for his other job. At least that's what he called it, his other job. He looked over at me, the bandaged mask over his face making him look like a mummy. I may look silly to you, but I have to keep this on when I'm working. It's the only way I can make sure the Enclave doesn't know who I am. I do this to keep you and your mother safe. Why do you have to do it, Daddy? I asked. Because this is what our family has always done. Your Uncle Stryker did this way before. He had to leave the Enclave. My father did it before him. 
his mother before him, and so on, all the way back to the creation of the Enclave. One day, Star, you'll have to take over for me. You'll be the thirteenth guardian, he said. I looked down on my hooves. But I'm not strong enough to do what you do, Daddy. He moved close and pulled me into a hug. One day, you'll be okay. Remember what Mommy is trying to try something new soon. You two will be going on a trip to see if she can cure you. You're coming too, right? He shook his head, then put on the desperado hat. No, sweetie, I have to stay here. The Enclave won't be happy that Mommy's leaving. I have to make sure that you two can get as far away from here as you can, before they come after you. But Mom said that once you're better, you can come home and see me again. I pulled my favorite doll close and gave it to him. Take Avon with you, Daddy. He'll keep you safe while I'm gone. I can't take him, sweetie. He's your protector, not mine. You can give him back to me when I see you again, I said. He smiled and put the bird in the pocket of his trench coat. Okay, I'll make sure that he gets back to you safe and sound. I'm going to miss you, Daddy. I saw a tear roll down his face. I'm going to miss you too, my little star. The memory was quick, but at that moment I knew who the stranger was. He'd been lying to me the whole time. I'm not sure why, but I knew I was right. I got back to my hooves and felt power rolling through me as I watched the Pegasus pull a hoof back and land one more blow on the stranger's head. The power rolled through me as I yelled, GET THE HELL OFF MY DAD! He looked over at me. Ah, shit. I blasted him away with my expulsion spell. The gem in his armor flashed, but he was still blown off the stranger and sent flying across the dry landscape. I ran over to the stranger and knelt down next to him. As I lifted my hooves, I noticed that his coat, my coat had turned white. I had to ignore it for now. Dad? Dad, please answer me. He groaned, and one of his eyes opened. What did you call me? Don't try to lie to me again. I know you're my dad. I'm starting to remember. But how? Grim said you wouldn't ever remember me. She said only one thing could make you remember, and she never told me what it was. I lifted Avon in my magic. This was the key when I saw it again. I remember the day I gave it to you. Why didn't you tell me? because you wouldn't have believed me. And even if I did, I didn't have the right to be your dad. Not after I let all this happen to you, he said. Blood was starting to stain the bandages around his mask. I need to get you back to Aura, but first we have to get that mask off you so I can see how bad your injuries are. Back away from him, courier, I heard the Pegasus say. Looking up, I saw my spell had blown his cloak and scarf off my eyes went wide as I looked at an older version of the stallion Mom had kissed in that memory orb. Only his aqua green coat was covered in burn scars. His mane was short with patches missing in spots. When he spoke, I saw that the inside of his mouth was burned. He must have had a bad fire or something. To have so many burns. Are you really Striker? I asked, my horn glowing again. Yes, I am. Now. Back away from him. Shadow, run, please, Dad said before coughing. No, I said, stepping over my father. I'm not letting any pony hurt you, not after I finally got you back. Uncle Stryker, I'm Shadow Star, daughter of Grimm. Mom lied to you when she said that I died. She used Stargazer to save me. Yes, I do have Aquila inside of me, and she's caged, and I'm keeping her under control. Now can you please stand down so we can talk about this? If not, I'm not going to let you hurt my dad. He's a snake. Even if you are who you say you are, you can't trust him. He's been lying to every pony for years now. He uses ponies to get what he wants. He always has. And he even took the mare that I loved when I was branded. He may have lied to me about who he was, but I still trust him. Really? How much of him do you remember? Niara know his name. 
what he looks like. I shook my head. It's coming back slowly, but not yet. I figured. Then you should pull off that mask. You'll understand what I mean then, he said. I'll wait. Looking back at my dad, I sighed. He's right. You can't keep hiding your face. He tried to get up, but he was too hurt. Shadow, you don't know what you're asking me to do. If any pony around here sees who I am, it'll ruin everything. See? You can't trust him, courier. Stryker started to say. Then Yaksha slammed into the ground next to him, followed a moment later by Aura. She pointed her spear at Stryker, saying, You'd better start explaining yourself, because the only reason you're not dead, Pegasus, is because Yaksha told me there's more going on here than I think. Yaksha cursed. Did you have to throw me down like that, Aura? Yeah, you lying bitch. You're lucky I didn't slit your throat. Now spill. Aura said, anger lacing her voice. Stardust flew up a moment later, followed by Windthrasher. He looked over at the stranger. Shit. Aura, you should help the stranger. He looks bad. I'll keep an eye on this guy. Damn, dude, what happened to your face? Stryker sighed. Was struck in an explosion. I guess the kid got you. Damn right I did. Wingnut said from where he was sitting on Aura's back. Aura walked over to the stranger and me. Damn it. I thought you could handle yourself better than this. I'm tired, and he got me by surprise, Dad said. You're shot, too. I need to get this outfit off you to see how bad the wounds are, Aura said. No, this isn't a debate, Aura said, reaching down and pulling his mask off. Something sparked, and she jumped back. The fuck was that? Stryker was the one who answered. One of his gems makes it only so that he or his family can take that mask off. Same for the outfit. That's how he keeps his identity safe. Shut up, Stryker! Dad, I don't care what you say, I'm taking this off of you. I said, reaching down with a hoof and pulling off the mask. Aura looked over at me. Wait, and this is your dad? How do you keep running into your lost family? I ignored her and pulled off my dad's mask and hat. I dropped it as soon as I did. No. How the hell didn't I know? A dark black face looked up at me. Small scars running over his muzzle, nose, and neck. His dark blue mane with a single silver stripe down the center. And his deep green eyes. Even though I never saw the eyes when I was in Mill City Tower. I now knew why he hid them. Because it would have picked up on who he was. I still knew that face. Nightshade? I guess the cat's out of the bag now, Nightshade said. Sorry, I couldn't tell you who I was before. No, but you're my best dad's best friend. Stryker laughed. Best friend? Nightshade doesn't have friends. Only ponies he ever cared about were his wife and daughter. And even then, I'm not sure if he really cared. Because if he did, he would have saved them. Looking back at Stryker, I yelled, I didn't ask you, now shut up! I'm sorry, but I couldn't tell you who I was. Grim made sure of that. I wanted to tell you so many times. Even if I could have told you, my work as both a guardian and a council pony made it impossible me to show myself. If the Enclave knew you were my daughter, they would do anything to use you against me. That's why I showed myself as a stranger. If I could help you without the Enclave knowing, Dad said. We can talk later. You need help, and I can't help you here. I have to get you back to camp, Morris said. All of you, bring those two with you. Stryker looked at Aura. Why would I go with you, Griffin? I answered. Stryker, from what I can tell, you don't know everything that's going on. If you want answers, then follow. If not, then I'll put you down here and now. 
I don't care if you're my uncle. Stryker looked at Yaksha, who shrugged. It is possible that I overreacted. To my surprise, Stryker laughed. Fine. I'll go with you. But you better answer all my questions. As we started to walk back, Windthrasher walked over to me, asking, Um, Shadow, what happened to your coat? I looked down and saw I was still white. Until then, I hadn't noticed that I was still holding onto the magic from Aquila. I can tell you later. I let go of the magic, and a moment later, my coat went back to normal. First, both of these stallions and Yaksha have a lot of explaining to do. Footnote. Level up. New perk added. Mysterious Pony, rank 4. Now that you know the truth behind the stranger's mask, you know how connected you really are with him, and why he goes all out for his way to protect you and many others. Due to this, he will now show up more often in sats and out of sats. Quest perk added. Shadow's Edge, rank 3. You've reached the final rank of this perk. You now fully understand what Aquila is and how her power works. With you taking away some of Aquila's magic, you can now use her power to help you in a fight. Along with this, your power has grown, along with your control of your own magic. Be careful, though. Aquila is cunning, and she may not be done with you just yet.